Jesus' ministry bears witness to God's coming reign. For the lowly are shown mercy and the dead are raised. Here Jesus ministers to a widow by raising her only son to life. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the seventh chapter. Soon afterwards, Jesus went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a large crowd went with him. As he approached the gate of the town, a man who had died was being carried out. He was his mother's only son, and she was a widow, and with her was a large crowd from the town. When the Lord saw her, he had compassion for her and said to her, Do not weep. Then he came forward and touched the bier, and the bearers stood still. And he said, Young man, I say to you, rise. The dead man sat up and began to speak, and Jesus gave him to his mother. Fear seized all of them, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has risen among us, and God has looked favorably on his people. This word about him spread throughout Judea, and all the surrounding countryside, the Gospel of the Lord. We turn now to our hymn, 356, O Jesus, Joy of Loving Hearts. <laughs> Greetings to you. Greetings on this day that the Lord has made a day for us to rejoice and be glad Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from his Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Elijah visits the widow at Zarephath. Jesus happens on the widow at Nain. Two widows, two sons, two deaths. And twice life is brought forth from death. These two situations, remarkably comparable yet decidedly different, capture our imagination because, well, because we know tragedy. We've known those, perhaps we're even one of those, who have tragedy visited upon them. Elijah. The first of the named Old Testament prophets firsts on the scene here in 1 Kings. The situation could hardly be more dire. The rulers of Israel, the very ones charged with responsibility for the people, have betrayed that trust by bowing down before false gods, specifically Baal. King Ahab and Queen Jezebel have even gone so far as to sacrifice their own son, their firstborn son, to this ravenous, unforgiving monster of an idol. Our introduction to Elijah comes as he pronounces to Ahab the consequences of such idolatry, saying in the name of the Lord, there will be no dew or rain in the years ahead unless I command it. In other words, the land is on its way to becoming desolate and deadly. Immediately, God sends Elijah from that appearance before Ahab into hiding in the Kareth Valley, promising him water from a brook and food delivered by ravens, themselves scavengers feeding upon carcasses. The stream dries up, and God sends him to Zarephath, in the heart of the country where Baal is worshipped. And there is a widow who, just like the ravens before her, has been commanded by God to tend to Elijah. A widow who, it turns out, considers herself as good as dead because she lacks sustenance for her and her son. But the Lord sustains Elijah in the widow and the son, and 
until her son is struck down by death. And the widow turns on Elijah, What have you against me, O man of God? You have come to bring my sin to remembrance and to cause the death of my son. Elijah, in turn, turns to God, crying, O Lord my God, have you brought calamity even on the widow with whom I am staying by killing her son? As Elijah prays for the return of life to this boy, the Lord answers his prayer, and Elijah carries the son to his mother, and the mother confesses, Now by this I know that you are a man of God, and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is true. Now compare the widow at me. Jesus, who some thought was the return of Elijah, did not confront the rulers at the beginning of his ministry, as Elijah did. No, that confrontation came at the end. The situation, though dire, was not that of the idolatry of the political rulers. It was the legalism of the religious rulers. The Pharisees, Sadducees, Sanhedrin, and others had replaced the God who held both judgment and mercy. Teaching of twisted retribution that saw in the circumstances of life divine reward and or punishment however you may have adhered to the law. Jesus was not sent into hiding and provided food. He made his way in public and fed the hungry around him. Jesus was not sent to the widow at Nain specifically. He happened upon her. This confrontation with death was not confined to the widow's house, but took place in public in front of the crowd. The widow doesn't speak. But we know her circumstance nonetheless. Her husband, dead. Her son, dead. Herself, as good as dead, and under that system of twisted retribution, both she and the entire community considered this the judgment and wrath of God visited upon her, they remembered her many and various sins. Jesus does not pray for the life of the return of life. He simply commands it. And when he hands the son back to the mother, it's not the mother's confession, but it's the crowd that declares, a great prophet has risen among us. And God has looked favorably on his people. This word went out. Not confined to one home, it went out spreading throughout the entire region. Two widows, two sons, and twice life is brought forth out of death. Tragedy, and the resolution of tragedy, the very currency of our situation in life is being dealt with here. A situation so dire, <coughs> if we had no human, a situation 